Well, there we go. Much better there. Nice to see your smiling faces on this last Sunday of July. Did, did it go fast? How many did it go fast? Pretty fast, eh? Uh, I think as you get older, it goes even faster. Well, it's good to be back with you. Uh, Diane and I have been away for the past week. We weren't here last Sunday. But uh, my name is Pastor Brian Pluff, and I'm the Honorary Associate Pastor here at West Guilford. That means I'm retired officially, but I fill in for Pastor Sean and Amy occasionally. And today I'm filling in for them as they are finished their first of two weeks of vacation at Joy Bible Camp. They love you dearly, but don't drop in. Let them have their vacation. Uh, um, I need to explain that I am not cool in any way, but I am cool because I have this newfangled fan on me. You see this? So this isn't a headphone. This is a fan that is blowing cool air so that I hopefully won't melt today as I give the Word of God. Because those of you who know me know that this, these lights that are right here cause a lot of perspiration. But that's okay. I'm willing to perspire for the Lord Jesus. Amen. A few announcements today. There's quite a few that are up on the board. I'm only going to uh, announce a few. Uh, next week, do not come to church here. <laughs> but do go and worship with the body of Christ of Halliburton County, Halliburton Village at least, as next week is, they call it the Sizzling Sunday Service. Uh, I hope it won't be too, too hot so we don't sizzle too much. But it's at Head Lake Park. It's at 10.30 to 11.30. And we come together as the churches in this area, most of the churches, and uh, we worship together outside. So you need to bring a lawn chair or a blanket if you want to sit on the ground, uh, a wide brim hat I'd recommend, and uh, if it's really hot, maybe a shade umbrella or something. But come and, and worship together. The music is always really nice because there's a combination of different people from different churches usually a good gospel message. So I encourage you next Sunday to go to Head Lake Park, 1030, and be part of that gathering of people. Tomorrow, we are having Kingdom Prayer Time, 1030, here at the church. I've been asked to lead, so we're going to have it up here at the front. I'm going to introduce a new song to some, uh, maybe new to some. It was new to me over the last few weeks, and it's really blessed my heart. So hopefully it'll bless the hearts of those who are there as well. Um, birthdays this month, or this week, this past week. Lots of birthdays this pack, past week. Mike Rowell, happy birthday. Marlene Taylor, she, I'm not sure if she's here. Brian Monahan had a birthday. Happy birthday. Heather Robertson had a birthday. Diane Johnson, where are you? Had a birthday. So happy birthday. In a small country church, we do that. And uh, let's just say happy birthday this way. Actually, if you had a birthday today on Sunday, you get a version of happy birthday, a Christian version, but nope. If you don't have it on Sunday, you don't get it. <laughs> I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. We're, they're going to lead us in worship in a minute. Our call to worship today is Psalm 100, and then I'm going to lead us in some prayer. The Word of God says this, Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We have an awesome God, don't we? Let's come together and talk to him in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for putting it in our hearts to come and worship together with brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Father, for your presence with us each and every day we thank you for the summer season, which for many is uh, a favorite because the weather is warm, 
the lakes are plentiful, and uh, we can either just enjoy watching them or enjoy being in them. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one who gives us joy, gives us the ability to come into your presence with joy. Even if our situation perhaps is not joyful, we can come into your presence because you live within us and you give us grace and strength. Fill us afresh with a sense of your presence today. Help us today to focus our minds and our hearts on you, not on our neighbors, not on the quality of anything, but on who we have come to worship, Jesus Christ, the living God. May you be blessed and glorified today through every part of our worship, Father. We commit it all to you. Father, we pray today for our pastors, Sean and Amy. We pray for them and their family. We pray for a deep refreshing to their spirit and rest for their bodies and uh, rest for their minds during this vacation time. We also pray for those who are sick or suffering. There are many in our congregation. I've been away, so I don't know all of them, perhaps most of them, but we've been asked to pray for Rick Doucette, whose health is not good right now, and to pray for Luca Padovin and his seizures that he's been having, Lord. We pray for mercy there and grace for him and his family and for the doctors for wisdom as to how to deal with things that are going on. We pray for those who have had long-term illnesses and perhaps haven't been here for a while but are watching via the Internet Father, we pray that you will just help them to know that you are with them. Father God, may we keep each other in our prayers as we hear of illnesses. May we pray for each other, trusting that you hear our prayers and you will answer them according to your perfect will. We also pray for next Sunday's church in the park, the sizzling Sunday service. We pray that it may be a joyful time of unity amongst God's people and that it may be a witness of the love of Christ to our community. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us. We commit this service to you now, and we pray together the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together through song. Good morning, everyone. Could you please stand and join us? rescued my soul his blood has covered my sin I believe I believe my shame is taken away my pain is healed in his name I believe I believe I'll raise the banner, cause my Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. I know He rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame is taken away. My pain is healed in His name. I believe. I believe. I'll raise. My Redeemer lives, my 
That's our desire today is to bring glory to Jesus Christ, our King. I love the part in that song that says, I seek the giver, not the gift. We seek his presence in our lives. We seek to know him more, to love him more, to serve him more. And as we do, his joy, his peace becomes more and more a part of our life. Our scripture reading is going to be a, a reading, a congregational reading. So if you don't know that term, that means that you, the congregation, are going to read it with me as we put it up on the screen. So it's coming soon. It's on its way. It's coming from one of those satellites. Ah, oh, there we go. Here it comes. So the reading is from Romans 10, 8b to 15. And I want you to really think about the words. We're going to try to, to uh, sing it with emphasis, uh, sing it, uh, read it with emphasis, but not race through it. So try to, let's go at the same pace as we start together. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. May the Lord bless his word as it's read and preached today. We're going to sing one more song together.
Thank you, team. Let's talk to the Lord before we hear the word of God proclaimed. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Speak to our spirit, to our heart, to our mind. May we hear from you in your precious word today, the living word of God. May each person here hear from you, Father, in whatever area you desire to talk to them about. We bow our hearts to you, we bow our lives to you, bow our knees to you. You are our Lord and our Savior, our Father, our God, our Creator. We recognize that and we thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding so we could put our faith in you today. If anyone is here today who has never put their trust in you, may you plant seeds in their heart as to how much you love them and as to why Jesus came to earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the scripture passage that we all read today from Romans chapter 10 is one of my favorite passages. It's one that, I'm sorry, can't hear me? The kids, kids, you want to stay for my message, don't you? No, the, kid, yeah, the mom says, I don't want to. Kids are welcome to go on downstairs to children's church at this time. It's great to have kids. Here, my wife Diane and I have spent the last week with our two grown daughters and their family, ten in total in a cottage, and we loved every minute of it. But I have to admit, when we got home yesterday, it was, what is that sound? It's peace and quiet. <laughs> and peace and quiet can be very nice when you're not used to having them underfoot 24-7 but we had a great time. We're going to be looking at the scripture we, we uh, read together. And as I said, it's one of my favorites. It's one that I have uh, prayed back to the Lord, one that I've used to witness for the Lord. It's one that just reminds me in my heart of the goodness of God and the goodness of the gospel. The line that says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might be saved. You will be saved. If you believe the truth of the gospel, that God loves you so much that he sent his son to show you his love in action, to prove it by his miracles, to prove it by his teaching, to prove it by things that people saw that they'd never seen from anyone else. And then ultimately, his mission was to go to die for not his sins, for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. The gospel message that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord of all, that he is indeed the Son of God who came to earth for us to show us the way get out of the consequences of our sin, if we repent and turn to him, our sins have been placed on Jesus when he was on the cross. And when he cried out, it is finished, he was crying out, I've done the Father and my will, and that is to come to take away the sins of the world for all who will believe, repent, and turn to him. It's, it's a wonderful verse. And it goes on, and a little later on it says, everyone who calls on the Lord, on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Everyone. That means no one is too far gone. That means Uncle Charlie, or whoever your Uncle Charlie is, who is so far from God, and is so uninterested right now in God, or your neighbor Fred, who lives next door, who knows you go to church on Sunday, and kind of stares out his window at you as if you're crazy. They are not too far from God that God can't reach them. That's the good news. 
is that God reaches down and saves those who are far from God. Some of you came to Christ when you were young, and so the memory of living in a world without Christ is not that fresh to you. It's maybe hazy. But some of us here came to know Christ in our teen years or later. I was 22 on the way to being an alcoholic like my mother who died at 39 from alcoholism. Or like my grandfather who died at 53 from alcoholism. I was well on the way when Christ and his mercy reached down and touched my heart. Touched my heart through someone just sharing the simple gospel that God loves me and Jesus died for me. And the Spirit did the rest. And by the grace and mercy of God, he came into my life and has been working in my life since then. I'm far from perfect. Sometimes I look back and say, you know, Lord, I'm almost 68 and I'm still only this far. I thought I'd be this far down the road by now. The goodness and grace of God. He saves us and then it is he who sanctifies us and makes us holy, separate, not perfect, separate from the world, gives us separate desires. You have separate desires today. If you're a Christian, hopefully you have a desire to glorify God, to please God, to serve God. And part of that desire should be to do what God tells us to do, to do the next steps. I remember when I prayed with this young girl of 16, when she prayed with me to receive Christ, she had never prayed with them ever before, and she prayed with me, and I opened my eyes and nothing was different, but my heart had been touched. And I remember that I thought, what do I do now? <laughs> the next day she brought me a Bible. Never looked at a Bible in my whole life, never opened a Bible. And I started reading. And Genesis is really interesting, isn't it? Adam and Eve and all those. But boy, when I got to Leviticus, I kept thinking, where's Jesus? <laughs> Where is Jesus? I haven't seen him yet in this book. And I got discouraged for a while, but he never left me. He helped me through those discouraging times. Those, and I went on a trip with a friend, and we had a long trip in Europe, and I met two girls in Europe, and their names were Faith and Joy. And they were Messianic Jewish girls. And as we talked, they said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, I, I prayed to receive Jesus. And I got this Bible, and they were all excited. But where's Jesus in this Bible? They, said, they smiled at each other, and they said, oh, he's in the New Testament. Oh, I've seen that in the, what, what is the New Testament? Oh, it starts in Matthew, and it started reading in Matthew. And then Jesus was everywhere. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was there. And he spoke to me, and he encouraged me, and he helped me. And when I came back and met my future wife, Diane, who's right here, by the grace of God, we fell in love, committed ourselves to serving Christ together, moved soon afterwards from Ottawa to Peterborough. I opened the first footlocker there that's still at Lansdowne Place. Had to find a church, found a church. I think the second Sunday we were there, the pastor, who was soon to retire, said, we're going to have a baptism service in a little while. All of you who have put your trust in Christ, one of the next steps for you is to be baptized. And I'd been thinking, what's the next step? Oh, went to the door and said, uh, what's uh, this baptism all about? Here's it. He was prepared. He had a little sheet with some, here's something about you can read. Came, read, read the scriptures. Within the next few months, we were baptized. What a wonderful feeling that was. This week, as I was preparing this message on my Facebook feed, this came up. Happened nine years ago this week. You can see it right now. There we go. <laughs> That's Sharon Bacon. Rick Pyle, Bill Timms, I'm not sure who that is. That Shelley, was it, did you get baptized at the same time? Whoever it is, this, this person, tall person, was going to be baptized. Can we play it again? Now listen to the voices in the background and the joy.
Sharon's in the hospital now and has been for a while. But one of the greatest days of her life was the day she was baptized. Have you been baptized? Have you put your trust in Christ? Have you been baptized? You may think, oh, I, yeah, I haven't got around to it yet, or uh, I have this or this. Or this. God wants you to be baptized for his sake, but for your sake too. There is great joy in being baptized, in knowing we've taken that step of obedience. The Bible says repent and be baptized. And so Sharon repented and was baptized that day. By the grace of God, I've seen hundreds of people baptized, most of them, many of them in lakes like Pine Lake here. Wonderful to see. All different ages, from little children right up to 90-year-olds who were afraid to go under the water, so we put the water in a pail over their head. God isn't legalistic. God wants us to know that he wants people to hear the good news, to repent, and then to go forward. And one of the first things to do is to be baptized. The second part of the passage that we read is really important as well from Romans. And I'm going to read it again. And it says this. How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I love that. There's a song that we're going to sing at the end of the service that talks about that. I remember reading it one of the first times thinking, they're big, but they're not beautiful. Size 12, you know, these hush puppies are big, but I don't know if I'd ever call them beautiful. But of course, it's not talking about physical feet. It's talking about how God says it's a beautiful thing when his children tell others the good news about Jesus. I mean, he's given that responsibility to us as his children, as his ambassadors. Not making that up, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are Christ's ambassadors who God wants to make his appeal to others through us. God wants to make his appeal to their hearts and their minds through us. We're his ambassadors. That's why he's left us here on earth, is to get the word out, to get the message out. And in the book of Acts, it seems that the first disciples took that very seriously. Now, they were scattered because they were being persecuted. I've never prayed, Lord, persecute us so that we can get the word out more. But in some countries where Christians are persecuted, the church is booming. In North America, the church is not booming. Some would say it's dying. More churches close every year than open. Small little country churches are usually not full. Like we are here almost now, 80 people averaging. By the grace of God and the mercy of God, he has renewed this church a couple of times by his mercy and grace. And God is doing a good work and wants to continue to do a good work through his church, but not necessarily just on Sunday morning. He wants to do it through us as we go about our way. As we go about our business, he wants to use us to be good will, good news ambassadors of his love. He wants us to tell people how much God loves them. That's, that's a privilege. That's a wonderful thing. And yet, for some people, it's very hard. I get that. Different personalities find it harder than others. I'm an introvert, as you can tell. No. <laughs> I'm an extrovert. If you don't know me very well, you may not. But I am very much an extrovert. And that probably helps in my telling people about the Lord. But I've known many introverts who prefer to be quiet and alone, and, but they have shared the gospel faithfully throughout their lives. For many, we have just not learnt uh, perhaps some some ways to share the gospel or some prayers 
that will help us to share the gospel. Lifeway, which is a big um, uh, information, Christian information company, has done a survey in 2014. They surveyed thousands of people. And in that survey, they found out that 78% of born-again Christians have not shared their faith in the last six months. I was surprised it was that hot, uh, that there was that many that had. Because other surveys say that sometimes we never share our faith. We've been Christians for years and we've never taken the time to pray through and ask God to help us to share our faith with others. I don't know where you are today, but Dr. David Jeremiah, a well-known pastor and Bible teacher, believes that most Christians seldom pray intentional prayers, asking God to help them to share their faith with their loved ones, their neighbors, or even strangers. Most never intentionally pray for God to help them. Maybe they don't know how to pray about it. Maybe that's the case you're in. So today, this week, as I was preparing, or last week, I prepared last week, this week I was at the cottage, God put it on my heart to read more from what Dr. David Jeremiah. And he has come up with a three-letter acrostic called BOW, B-O-W. And he says that he tries to use it daily, and it has opened the eyes of his heart and his mind, and that he has been able to share the good news most weeks, if not every week. He's a man now probably close to 80 years of age. He says he has not led hundreds to the Lord, maybe dozens, but he has shared the good news many, many, many times. See, it's not your job to lead people to Christ. We use that phrase. You know, don't, don't give yourself too much credit. It's the Spirit of God that draws people. But the Word of God says that who's going to hear if no one preaches to them, if no one tells them? And so I want us to look at the three letters of this acrostic of Baal and see perhaps how we can pray it. It's no good if you just hear this message today. I'm telling you, you might as well go and get to wherever you're going for lunch early. But if you start to pray it, I believe God will use it. I've been praying it for a couple of weeks, and it's given me more and more of an intentionalist about sharing the gospel. The B is for boldness. God wants us to pray that he will give us holy boldness to share with people the good news that Jesus loves them and died for them and rose from the dead. He wants us to pray that the Holy Spirit will stir our hearts and stir our spirits so that we can have the courage to overcome our fears and sometimes our apathy. Oh, I know, that's a hard one to hear. None of us want to think we're apathetic in any way. Fear of not knowing what to say. That's, that's legit. Fear of being rejected by other people. That might be the case too. Fear just because we're maybe a little timid in our, in our nature. Apathy is, you know, I wish I had known that you were talking on prayer because I'm not really interested. I say my prayers in the morning, I say them at night. It's kind of a ritual prayer, and that's good enough for me. Then you will never pray, and you will probably very seldom ever share your faith. I've had people say that. I've been a Christian all my life, but I've never felt the need to tell anyone about my faith. It's almost like saying... I don't care if they go to hell or not. We had someone who worked with youth ministry with us, Diane and I, in Peterborough when we were youth sponsors at the first church we were ever involved in. And she was just a, a university student. Her name was Beth. And she loved coming to youth group because we had a lot of fun, crazy things. And she was just a year or two older than some of the kids. And, but she, she never was serious about talking about the Lord or anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Devotion time, she'd be kind of writing in her journal about her day. And uh, 
Except one week she came to youth group and her face was all white, whiter than white. I said, Beth, are you okay? You feeling? I gotta talk to the group tonight. I gotta talk to them right away if I can, Brian. I said, okay. Okay, Lord, okay. We got them together, quieted down, said, Beth has something she wants to share with you. And she said, this week I had a dream that was the most vivid dream I've ever had. And it scared me right down to my root. All of a sudden, everybody was quiet and listening. Beth? This crazy and wild Beth? Talking like this? She said, I dreamt I was in a line ready to go to heaven. And I was so excited to see Jesus. And the line was moving up and I was getting more and more excited. It was the most beautiful feeling I've ever had. And then I noticed that coming the other way was one of my dear friends in high school. And I was a Christian all through high school. And she was coming with her head down. And as she came close to me, she looked up at me and she said, why did you never tell me? Why did you never tell me about Jesus? You never told me about Jesus. And she just kept walking. And I woke up. I got to tell people about Jesus. I got to tell you about what Jesus has done. And she shared her testimony that night planted some wonderful seeds in the hearts of a rather large youth group. Many were from the community, weren't Christians. Some, by the end of that year, had come to know Christ. Some shared that it was best testimony that day that caused them to start to think seriously about Jesus. God doesn't want to guilt trip you, but he wants you to have boldness to tell people the good news. And it starts with praying. 1 Timothy 1, 7 and 8 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or fear, that's another version, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. Do not be ashamed. Sometimes that's part of the fear package. It's where, oh, you know, I don't know enough. I, I can't prove it. That's why it's called faith. You share from where you're at. You share with what God has already given you. When I first became a Christian, I had friends who said, how do you know this is all true? And I said, because someone told me and God has spoken to my heart and he's changed my heart. But where in the Bible? Uh, uh, John 3, 16. Has anybody ever noticed I quote that often? First verse I ever memorized. And that's all I had. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what I knew in the first early days. That's all I had memorized. That's what I shared. And I shared how he touched me the night I came to Christ. And lo and behold, some of them wanted to know more. Some of them told me, oh, go away. I don't want to hear anymore. You know, ah, good for you, but not for me. I was such a young Christian that my response to my best friend who I wanted in the kingdom of heaven was, well, if you, if you don't want to believe then that's okay. You go to hell then. I, w I wouldn't go that way. That's not the best way to go. But, hey, I was a young Christian. God wants us to pray for holy boldness. And it comes to those who ask God for love-empowered courage and concern. For those who do not know him it comes to those who ask God for love empowered courage and concern for those who do not know Jesus because they are separated from his love and if they were to die today they would live eternity separated from his love well, that's not much of a loving God if you would if they want to live separated from him on this earth then he will let them live their eternity separated. But our job is to plant seeds, is to tell them. We need to have the boldness to tell people. It's not your job or my job to convince them or argue them into accepting Jesus. That's not your job. Our job is simply to lovingly tell them the good news, to maybe give them a have a good day little booklet that our brother Jim gives out, Jim Cowling to everybody, 
who he once a month he's always giving them out to people everybody he met meets it's one of the tools that God has given him that seems to work he'll tell you and show you in other ways our job is to tell them the good news tell them how he changed your life he has changed your life right if you're a Christian today you need to have had a changed life. You can't be living the exact same way you did before you accepted Jesus. We can fall into that comfort zone, and sometimes the Lord needs to shake us out of that. We need to recommit ourselves, and that's a good thing. But we will never boldly share the gospel unless we are striving to live the gospel, striving to be the person God wants us to be, the best person. Now, some people seem to have the gift of evangelism, and some are called to go maybe on the street corner and tell people, and that's good if you're called to do that. But God has never called you and I to be rude, to be obnoxious in any way, but to lovingly be bold and honest about Jesus' love for them, to tell them the good news. Pray for that. B is for bold. Ask God for holy boldness. And that leads to the O, which stands for opportunities. If you're not praying that God will give you boldness, why would he give you opportunities and bring them to mind? Ask God for opportunities to be God's ambassador of love and compassion and caring for those around you. Because there are people all around us who want to hear the gospel, who want to know the answer as to why am I here? Why am I on this earth? There are people all around us looking for answers. The fields are white unto harvest, Jesus said. Pray that the Lord will send in harvesters. But we need to be seed planters first. Some get the opportunity. Our mission partner, Brody Haight, Everywhere he goes, he leads people to Christ. God has given him just wonderful sensitivity towards people whose hearts are ready. And the words to say, and he goes and he says them, and they come to Christ, and he prays with them. And he tries to follow them up, but then he's off on another mission trip. He is truly a missionary that goes where the Spirit leads him. If he ever comes to speak here again, make sure you come, because his testimony will blow your mind as to what God has done in his life. Romans 10, 13 to 15, again, let me see, say what it says. is How can they call on the Lord, they, uh, on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? You are the one that he is sending. I am the one he is sending. I've had people say, you know, I, I, I don't get it. Because it says, unless someone preaches to them. I'm not a preacher. I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm not Pastor Sean. I'm not you, Pastor Brian. I'm not a missionary. I'm just really an ordinary person. I'm quiet. Even a bit of an introvert, some of you may be thinking. And I don't like it when people preach at me. So I don't want to preach at them. You know, that word preach has caused you to stumble. The word preach comes from the Greek word keriso, K-E-R-Y-S-S-O. And some scholars say it literally means this, to proclaim or speak with enthusiasm. To proclaim or speak with enthusiasm. Does that help? You don't have to get up here and preach. To proclaim, to tell people with enthusiasm the good news. And that's important because for a lot of Christians, the enthusiasm, we don't want to be fanatical. So, oh, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I accepted Jesus when I was 13. Yeah, and it's really made a big change in my life. You should consider that. There should be nothing that you're more enthusiastic about than your salvation. God reached down from heaven and he saved you because he loved you. Not because you deserved it, but because of his 
love. Look for opportunities to tell people about that love, to speak with enthusiasm about that love. Look for opportunities. Listen, you will not see the opportunities to share your, uh, Jesus' love if you don't want to. If in deep in your heart nobody else knows but you know, I really don't, I don't want to. You know, that's the bottom line. Is I, I don't feel comfortable talking about my faith. Where is that word found in the Bible? Comfortable? It's not found in the Bible. Certainly not about sharing your faith. It's not a comfortable thing. It's an obedient thing. It's a joyful thing. It's an opportunity to tell people about Jesus and then he blesses your heart and your life for your faithfulness. Jesus said to his disciples when they were talking about food, where did he get food? In John 4, 34 to 35, he wasn't talking about physical food at all. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Open your eyes. The opportunities are there, but you need to want those opportunities. You need to see that as an important part of your life. Maybe one of the most important. Maybe a neglected part of your life. Because when you wake up and pray in the morning, how often do we say, Lord, help me to see the opportunities before me. Help me to see and act upon those opportunities. Make that part of your life now. Not only do we need to bow our hearts and we need to ask God to, to help us in every way, we need to ask him to give us eyes to see the opportunities. And he will. He will give you eyes to see, and then you can plant seeds in their hearts, seeds that he has worked within your life. The W in the word bow that we should be praying for is wisdom. Why is that not first? Why do we not pray for wisdom first? Well, you could but it doesn't make a very good acrostic. We need to pray for wisdom. Do it first, do it second, do it second. But bow, if it helps you, the W is for wisdom. Not only give me opportunity, but give me wisdom then to know what to say and to who. Give me re wisdom to know the right time and the right place to share with people. When you go shopping at the independent grocery store, just if, for example, on a Friday at four in the afternoon in the summer, you will find it is a busy place. You will find that there is a lineup on every cashier. And when you get to the cashier, if you start to say, could I tell you about Jesus? I'd like to, do you have five minutes? They would say, Manager to aisle three. Manager to aisle three. Fanatic. Fanatic. <laughs> that is not the time and place, probably. God will give you wisdom as to when that right place is, if you're praying for it. And if the thought comes into your mind and the, the place seems to be right, you have really no excuse not to, and yet you still kind of, oh, yeah, yeah maybe... Uh, I'll get another opportunity, right? He's gracious. He will give you other opportunities, but don't miss that one. And it doesn't have to be long. It can be as simple as saying, thank you very much. God bless you. Hope you have a great day. Maybe that's all he's called you to do that day. Or maybe it's to go a little bit farther and say, did you know God loves you? What? They're confused. What God? Maybe it turned into more of an opportunity. Ask for wisdom, and God will give you wisdom. James 1.5 says, Any of you who lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all. To all his children who come and ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. That's a promise. But if you don't ask for it, we have to want that wisdom. 1 Peter 3.15 says, 
always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't hit them over the head with the gospel. Don't hit them over the head with the good news so that it feels like bad news. Gentleness and respect. Be, be prepared. Well, how do I prepare? Read the word. Study the word. You don't have much to share if all you know is John 3.16. Still one of my favorite verses, but by the grace of God, there are many, many others that God has put in my heart that I've memorized at times. I couldn't tell you the whole book of James, but at one time I memorized most of it. But I couldn't, but when I need it, God brings it up. That's part of the faith journey, is that God will bring it back to our remembrance if we've studied it, if we've read it, if we've asked God to speak to us through it, if we've gone over it time and time again. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to be Pastor Brian, Pastor Sean. God wants to use you, and you, and you, and you. He wants you to be the best you that you can be. Lots of times, though, we need to acknowledge that we haven't, we haven't studied the Word as much as we should. We haven't put in the time. We haven't tried to understand God's Word enough, and we feel insecure because maybe it's been a long time since we've even read the Word. When I was at Briarcrest Bible College studying, I had a teacher. He was a great teacher. Dr. Barkman was his name. He was almost an NHL defenseman. Almost got on with the Toronto Maple Leafs, was in the AHL when he was a young man. Then God called him to become a Bible teacher. And he had a beautiful prayer right before you took an exam. So exam time came and he said, I want to pray for you students. Sounds good. The first time you have ever had him, he said, oh, he's going to pray for me. Good. And then he prayed something to this effect. Lord Jesus, I pray for your grace and mercy. But most of all, I pray that you will bring to remembrance those things that these students have diligently studied. Amen. And I'd look around and there'd be people almost shaking. Why do you have to pray that prayer? Why couldn't you just leave it at grace and mercy? Those things that they've diligently studied, but I haven't diligently studied. Well, then, maybe you aren't going to have too much brought to mind. God wants to use us, his people, but we need to be growing in our own faith. We need to be growing in our understanding of the word of God. And as we do, God will help us. He will give us boldness. He will give us opportunities, and he will give us wisdom because he has called us to be his ambassadors. You and I, what a privilege to be called his ambassadors. Pastor Sean would call this the big finish. People are hungry for the truth and will listen to your truth if they believe that you care and truly believe what you are telling them about and want what is best for them. They will listen if they believe that you care. If, they, if it's your truth and you say, this is what God has shown me to be truth, can I tell you? Ask them. Sometimes they will say, no, I'm not interested. Then you say, okay, maybe another time. Don't say, I'm going to tell you anyways, because that's not going to do any good at all. They're hungry for the truth. And they will listen to someone to tell their truth if they believe you care and you want what is best for them. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who loves us and loves this world and proved it by sending Jesus, your son, into this world. Now you've called us to be your ambassadors. You've called us to go forth and to ask you to give us the boldness to share the good news. Take away our fear, Lord. 
We ask you to help us to see, have eyes to see the opportunities. And help us, Father, to have the wisdom to know the timing and to the words to say and how to say them according to our personalities. Help us to be diligent to study your word, Father. We need to keep growing or we will become stagnant. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us for the last song.
Father God, we believe that you reign and that you will reign for all eternity. May you help us as we leave this place to sense your presence in our lives, to be willing to bow before you and to pray that you may use us to share the good news. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. God bless you.